In this video, we're going to derive the relationship between work and kinetic energy. Now, it's important to remember that work is energy transferred to or from an object by the application of a force. So forces transfer energy between two different objects. And one of the important things to remember is only external forces transfer energy to objects. That is, an object cannot do work on itself. So to derive the work kinetic energy theorem, we're going to transfer kinetic energy to a car by the application of a force. So in this case, imagine we're either standing behind this car, pushing this car in what we'll call the forward direction, or we're standing in front of this car with a rope or a chain attached to it and pulling it in this direction. So this is going to be the external force acting on this car, causing it to move in this direction. Now let's say this force causes this car to move in the forward direction, a total distance, which we'll call delta x, in the forward direction, in the positive x direction. Now if you remember from Newton's second law of motion, forces cause objects to accelerate in the direction of the net external force. So this external force is going to cause this car to accelerate in the forward direction, in the positive x direction. And what you should remember from Newton's second law is that forces cause objects to speed up, slow down, or change direction. So this force is going to cause this car to change its velocity from some initial value to some final velocity. So again, this force causes this car to accelerate changing the velocity of this car. Now one of the questions that we can ask right away is how much does this force increase the velocity of this car as this force is applied over this distance? And to answer that question, we can go back to the study of kinematics. And we can use the relationship that says the final velocity of this car squared equals the initial velocity of the car squared plus two times the acceleration times the distance over which this car is accelerating. Now if we want to know the acceleration of the car, what we need to do is we need to take this initial velocity term, which we're going to assume is not equal to zero meters per second. That is, we're going to assume the car has some initial velocity. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract the initial velocity squared from both sides. What you do to one side of the equation, you have to do to the other. And when you do that, what you should get is the final velocity of the car squared minus the initial velocity of the car squared, and that's going to equal two times the acceleration of the car times the distance over which that force acts. And since we're looking for the acceleration of the car, we're going to divide both sides by two times the distance over which the force acts. What you do to one side, you have to do to the other. And what you should notice is this two cancels out with that two. This delta x cancels out with this delta x. And we get a relationship that tells us what the acceleration of the car is in terms of the final velocity of the car, the initial velocity of the car, and the distance over which that force acts. And this relationship is going to be very important to our derivation of the work kinetic energy theorem. And to reiterate the point, this acceleration equation tells us how much this force increases the velocity of this car over this distance. Now in this example, we're looking at motion in the x direction. But the relationship that we're about to derive, the work kinetic energy theorem, holds in all three spatial dimensions. That is, it holds in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction, or any combination of all three of those directions. And the other thing to take note of is even though we're assuming for right now a constant force acting on this car, the work kinetic energy theorem holds for non-constant forces as well. So all we've done right now is look at how Newton's second law of motion tells us how much a force changes the velocity of an object. So what I'd like to do now is show how we can reformulate Newton's second law of motion with the definition of work to come up with an extremely powerful energy theorem. So in this case, we know that work equals the external force acting on an object times the distance over which that force acts on this object. So in this case, we're assuming that the force acts in the same direction that the object is displaced. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use Newton's second law of motion, which says that force equals the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object, and then we're going to multiply it by the distance over which that force acts. So work also equals the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object times the distance over which the force is acting. And one of the things that we did was we came up with a relationship that told us how much this force changes the acceleration of this object. And that relationship said that the acceleration of the object was the final velocity squared minus the initial velocity of the object squared divided by two times the distance over which this force acts. And so we have to write this now as mass times this is the acceleration of the object subject to this external force times the distance over which that force acts. Now we can simplify a few things. Notice that there's a delta x here and a delta x here, so these two terms cancel out. And we can rewrite this as mass times the final velocity of this object squared minus the initial velocity of the object squared divided by two. And then the next step to simplify this, we can bring this one half term out into the front. So we can now write this as one half the mass of the object times the final velocity of the object squared minus the initial velocity of the object squared. And the one last step to simplify this is we can distribute 
this term here to both of these squared velocity terms. And when we do that, we get 1 half the mass of the final velocity of the object squared minus 1 half the mass of the initial velocity of the object squared. Now this term right here and this term right here is defined to be the kinetic energy of an object. In this case, this is what we call the final kinetic energy and this is the object's initial kinetic energy. So this is how much energy an object has by virtue of its motion. So now we can actually abbreviate this. So an object's kinetic energy can be written as one half the mass of the object times the velocity of the object squared. So this is the kinetic energy of an object. And so we can abbreviate each one of these terms here. So this is as the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. So what we did was we said that the work is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the object. And since this is the change in the kinetic energy, you'll sometimes see the work written as the change in the object's kinetic energy. So this is an equivalent way to express this idea. Now a few things before we end this video. Notice that this velocity term is squared. So, so one of the important ideas about kinetic energy is kinetic energy is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. And in this case, the units used to measure energy are going to be the units of joules. So one of the important concepts is kinetic energy depends on the object's velocity, but not on its direction. So the kinetic energy of an object will be the same regardless of whether the object is moving up, down, left, or right. And consequently, the mathematics of energy is often easier than the vector mathematics required by Newton's laws. And that's one of the reasons that we're going to start to develop this work kinetic energy theorem, and then later the conservation of energy theorems.